Our namesake kind of infers that you have to be part of Congress or rich and famous or an old family in Washington, D.C., and that's not the case. The only requirement for being buried here is you have to be dead. Far from being exclusive, the Congressional Cemetery is now a public, thriving cemetery. You found him? Good. Good. It's an impressive stone, isn't it? But just a few decades ago, it was in a state of disrepair. 1980s and 1990s, the church that owned the cemetery couldn't afford to keep it up. The neighborhood was a rough place. The cemetery was abandoned. The weeds were up to your neck, and it was an awful place to be. There was a lot of drug dealing and prostitution. Where our preservation started, local dog owners here on Capitol Hill felt sorry for families that had to bury someone in an abandoned cemetery. So they self-taxed themselves starting in 1989 to mow the yard just enough to get a hearse and a casket to a gravesite. And so, the cemetery has gone on to the dogs. Have you in roll call? <laughs> we have a dog walking membership program um, that they can come in and walk their dogs off leash. DC being DC, there's someone walking their dog at three in the morning because they're going to work at four in the morning. So we're open 24 seven to the dog uh, walkers. We actually encourage uh, people to come in and use the cemetery as a public place. Uh, it's almost like a central park for this part of Capitol Hill. But we also offer book clubs, we do yoga in the cemetery, whereas we do movie nights, cinematary we call it. And then our biggest event of the year is Soul Strolls, where you go to the gravesite where there is an actor telling the ultimate demise of that person. I felt the fingers underneath the skull and they ripped off my scalp. A scar you can still see to this point. <laughs> Once in a while, we do get a little pushback um, about our events and people walking on graves. What we like to explain to them is what all these events do now is raise enough money for the restoration and preservation of these grounds today. The United States government owns the sites where our cenotaphs are. So this is the row they're in, and this is the site where the cenotaph is for these congressmen and senators. When the cemetery was founded in 1807, the federal government bought up land there to provide cenotaphs to every member of Congress who died. Cenotaph translates from Greek into empty tomb. So most of these don't have bodies under them. You got one of those whether you wanted to be buried at Congressional or not. It's the same Aquia sandstone that the U.S. Capitol building is um, composed of. It lasted up to 1876 when a Congressman Hoare from Massachusetts didn't like the design of the cenotaphs, so he cut off funding. <laughs> Before there were funeral homes, you had to keep grandma in the front room, which could be got, become inconvenient for any number of reasons, especially in Washington, D.C. in the summertime. So what you would do is you would rent a space in our public vault. In addition to John Quincy Adams, we had William Henry Harrison and Zachary Taylor all spent time in the public vault. Dolly Madison spent uh, more than a year in the public vault. Um, it hasn't been used since the 1930s uh, when embalming was full force. While the public vault is no longer in use, the cemetery does still have funerals and burials. We're now doing um, about 75 a year. You just buy a plot. Um, we have about 5,000 plots left. We've been had a huge increase in plot sales um, in advance and at need and now people realize it's a beautiful place that they too can spend their last final forwarding address at. We use it for funerals, parties. I had my 50th birthday party in here. It's great. I had the bar set up on the altar. <laughs> these are what uh, the caskets would roll in from the outside near those stained glass windows. And it's just like the back of a hearse. It has these roller bars. People like to get creative. Uh, we allow them to go as tall as they can afford. This is Thomas Mann. He was a librarian at the Library of Congress for decades. He designed his tombstone as a Dewey Decimal System. We're really unique. We have an LGBT section. The only cemetery in the world that I can find that has a kind of self-segregated LGBT section. I actually have a plot um, not far from the gate corner. It was selling so fast that uh, I reserved one for myself, <laughs> even though I'm 53, I'm like, I'm going to be near the gate corner here. We have Matthew Brady over here, the Civil War photographer, and a lot of contemporary photographers want to be buried, of course, near Matthew Brady. This is our new little um, pet cemetery, which we just uh, opened up this summer. I learned from another cemetery, be careful not to assume it's all going to be dogs and cats. They said the first pet that they buried was a pet alligator. We didn't want to call it a pet cemetery because literally the week we finished this, the movie came out. I'm like, oh, come on. Well, sometimes. That is better. On the Halloween note, <laughs> it is, is the place haunted? We like to think that because this is the final resting place for almost 70,000 people, that they like to go and haunt their old house or the old hotel or the bridge that they died on rather than haunting their own uh, bedroom, if it were. Mm -hmm.